Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> oh, good start. Welcome to um, Still Alive. So, Ronnie, are you still alive? Uh, just about, I think, Roger. Are you are you very still alive or only a bit still alive? <laughs> pro pro probably at my age, just a bit still alive, really. Just kind of bringing on, really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of uh, muddling through. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I think so, so yeah. <laughs> right, what I'm going to do, because I forgot to do it last time, I'm going to put this on. Um, because for the people who are not on uh, my YouTube channel, uh, that's the best place to be if you want to take part in the chat and it's the easiest way to ask questions and stuff uh, as well. So that's the easiest place to be. So I thought I'd <clears throat> I'd put that up there. So, um, hi, we've got uh, Jonah Tech, 6666666669, BC, Anarchy for Sale. <laughs> <laughs> Animals are here uh, <laughs> yeah. with us, uh, not for even us. anarchies yeah. for sale. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's quite good. That's I think that's supposed to be in one of those emojis, but it didn't come. It obviously didn't work. So uh, <laughs> there you go. Wow! Now look at this. Oh, Jane, hi, Jane. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Jane, wow. John's here as well. Well. The weird thing is, we were talking about you two today because I'm preparing my time tunnel, which you might have seen the advert for, and um, <clears throat> I know that you've read that book, and um, and so I, we were talking about you, and because we were going through the relationship between the ALF and the Nile, weren't we, Ronnie? So, um, uh, kind of a bit, yes, yeah, yes. So, well, that's how I'm going to start my time tunnel because uh, because we're coming up to. I mean, this is how professional things are nowadays, Ronnie. Because we're coming up to Valentine's Day, I thought I'd do one on um, Operation Valentine, which was, I think, it's still regarded as one of the most famous raids, um, uh, certainly back in those days. What do you think? Yeah. Oh, I think it was, and and, mm. and, and and I think it. I've always thought it'd make a great movie. You know that whole. <laughs> you know, that whole, I've always thought that. I thought it'd be, all right, it'd, okay. it'd be great. It's got all the elements, hasn't it? There's, there was a, a car chase. Well, it wasn't a car chase. It was a, the police chasing a minibus that went through a police blockade. A, and min, a minibus so chase. It's got, yeah. yeah, minibus <laughs> chase. And it's got, you know, the it's got the, you know, people carrying out the beagle. It's got everything, really. It'd make a great, it'd be great for the cinema, that. And I, mm. I don't know why it's, it's never been taken up. It probably would. Hello to uh, Colleen. How are you doing? So welcome along. Right. <clears throat> Just letting everybody settle in. So um, today, Ronnie, we're, we're talking about our own kind of journey from kind of supply side activism, for which we paid a bit of a price, to demand side campaigning. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one way that I've often talked about it is that we stopped looking for enemies to fight and we started looking for people to educate. That's one way that, that I talked about it. And it needs to be said right in the early days of this program that this is not um, a major critique or attack on anybody. It's just our own reflection of, of what happened to us, really, isn't it, Ronnie? So that, that, yeah. that's kind of where we're at. But it... In terms of kind of cards on the table kind of situation, for me, it is a. I am a bit perplexed that if we, well, well, this could be the the issue, but if we decide that vegan education is probably the best thing we can do, in other words, are there more ethical vegans out there? Yes, so therefore let's go and find them. Then it it baffles me why vegans are not doing that. To be honest, Ronnie, and doing other things instead. So, well, I think the thing is that, 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 that I, I think that the, the overriding problem is that most vegans, or certainly people who call themselves vegan, um, aren't doing anything active, whether that be vegan education or or any other type of um, yeah. Act, well, that, yeah, that's, the, that's the number one problem, isn't it? That's, that, the, number, that's, yeah. that's the number one problem, and I think we kind of have to make, uh, you know, I want to make that clear. Yeah, I think so. Too. Um, and and, and that, that's the number one problem that that, that, that we face. And uh, because I'm all saying, like, back, back in the day, you go, go back to the 70s, 80s, 
um, if someone was a vegan, that there was a very strong chance they were also an activist. All right, they wouldn't have been a, 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 an activist in those days in vegan outreach, but they'd been an, would be an activist um, campaigning on, you know, to protect animals for for, uh, for animal rights. You know, they'd be act, act, activists against uh, vivisection, against the fur trade, etc. You know, they'd be activists, they'd be campaigners. Um, nowadays, um, that's very rare. Most most vegans don't don't do don't do vegan outreach, and they don't do um, any other sort of campaigning um, for, for, you know for other animals. And that is the number, that is the number one, one problem, and and, and we, we need to say that before kind of going into. Um, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, if, uh, if, yeah, that's right. I mean, if if there's a a single kind of major issue, it's all the inactive um, vegans. Yeah. So yes. That, that, no, ab absolutely, yeah. and we need to yeah. kind of make make that clear. So we're we're kind of talking about um, kind of something else. I mean, we may come back to that issue, you know, later in the show. But kind of we're actually talking about you know, how we kind of changed our minds, not on, you know, the, the kind of validity of actions, but on, I, I suppose, on the on, on the effectiveness of, of, of certain actions and on the priority that needs to be given to different actions in terms of achieving yeah, animal liberation. It's the zero-sum game issue. It's kind of where, where, given the range of things that need to be done and the range of things that can be done, where, where do you put your priorities essentially? And I'll tell you what, it was, it, it's been a two stage thing with me because one thing that happened to me very early on, well, I say that, but we I mean, were talking about say four or five years in, cause I was, um, I was a full on sab for about at least four years. Uh, I mean, we're out, we're out three times a week. Sometimes I used to go out on my own on, on a motorbike mm. if nobody else was around. And um, and but then I I started to learn about animal use in more general general things, and then I started to realise that my effort could be put elsewhere, compared with you know driving past all these farms and laboratories to get to the hunting field, and you, obviously it's a good thing you 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 save a fox, save a save hares, for example, but it's kind of you know hit and miss because sometimes the hunts won't won't catch anyone anyway. Mm. And so all of that started to think, am, am I, um, you know, am I using my time the best? And I, I, I decided that I wasn't. And so I started to move into the kind of action groups. But then there was still kind of single issue stuff. We're talking about, you know, early to mid 80s now, you know, whereas the sabbing started, um, you know, late 70s. So, hmm. I mean, did, did I mean? What was your? I mean, we we know quite a few people who've stayed at Sabbing. Yeah, for, yeah some some people are kind of right into it for some reason. I mean, I I I started off. I mean, I mean, I I, I became um, I became vegan in seventy two, and I'd previously been been vegetarian for two and a half years. And the minute it became vegan, I I kind of, you know, when I kind of was aware of that enormity of the the oppression of other animals by humans i immediately wanted to to become active in some way and i got involved in the hunt sabs because i think that was the first thing i saw it was a it was on the television there was a, a news item about the hunt sabs i thought oh great you know there's people actually doing yeah, something you, you uh, saw somebody being whipped didn't you i saw sabs being yeah being attacked at a hunt meet mm. and i thought right you know you know there's these these people here trying to save save the fox and they're being attacked i need i need to go there and help them you know and so i um I, I soon got involved in the sabs um and then um but i kind of uh, i sort of felt the same as 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 you really in the sense that it was a lot of effort put into something where there often was kind of very little reward for it and i kind of much preferred um when um we kind of formed the band of mercy which was the precursor to the ALF. And uh, we started going to the hunt kennels in the middle of the night and damaging their vehicles so they couldn't go out the, the next day, or hopefully they couldn't. Um, I much preferred that because it was kind of, a, you know, a, a, a sort of very quick action. You weren't spending hours and hours driving around, often trying to find a hunt that, you, that wasn't there and stuff. And I kind of, and also it was, um, you know, eventually we, we, 
adopted this idea of like economic sabotage. It was causing loss to these financial loss to them, which would hopefully, you know, kind of put them out of business. And I much preferred doing that. I, I thought that was a kind of much more kind of efficient is, way. Is the question for you then, Ronnie. Did, did yeah. the Band of Mercy actions against the hunt, did it stop them going out or did it delay them going out? So, well, well, it, it, it depended because basically the reason, the reason we, we, we started it was to do with cub hunts which is kind of like a form of hunting early in hunt, hunt season where they don't actually chase the fox they just send the the hounds into a wood and massacre the and massacre the foxes you know the young the young fox cubs they block the earth so that when the the, the cubs and their parents kind of come back from from hunting um themselves um they can't go back in the earths and so they're above ground and they send the hounds in and they surround the woods so they uh, and make a lot of noise so they can't escape so there's no chase involved you see and, and you know the hunt sabs activities are really involved at kind of disrupting the chase after a fox and so we'd stand there helpless you know massively outnumbered not being able to do anything and i think this is where the idea of going to the hunt kennels um Usually in the early hours of the morning, sabotaging their vehicles. Yeah, that's kind of where that arose. And, and well, I know that um, you, you kind of, often you didn't kind of know whether it's successful or not, um, because you'd be gone. And um, but there was there was one hunt where we waited around, and uh, <laughs> it, it it was it was actually called off. They, they because we sabotaged several vehicles, and when when they're um, when when their their hound wagon that they used to transport the dogs when that broke down, they they called the master of the hunt to get him to bring his horse box to transport the hounds in. But we'd already been to his house and sabotaged oh, right. his oh. horse box. You see, so we can't, well, even, can't. even the, even the, even <laughs> yeah. the cavalry was. Um, so, so, so yeah, so so I mean, the, that, weird, it, the weird so thing about got, sabbing yeah. and the weird thing about hunting is they're both a bit hit and miss, aren't they? Because it's no guarantee that they're gonna kill anyone. And yeah. and so therefore, there's no guarantee that that the Sabs are going to save anyone, because the hunt might have a barren day um, anyway. And then there was that terrible yeah. thing, and I think I've said this on another still alive, a terrible time when we were on the way to a hunt and um, and we killed a squirrel in the car on the on the way to the hunt. In fact, yeah. I think we were going around because I used to, you know, the OS maps. I I got quite good at reading those. Yeah. I think I yeah. was. In there, and this squirrel kind of dashed out, and of course we caught him. You know, yeah. But so. I, I mean, I still think that you know, you know, hunt sabbing is a positive thing. You know, they, they you know, foxes and and other animals are saved by, you know, by the actions of the sabs, and and you know, it's something I I do support. It's something I've you know, I mean, obviously I've not been sabbing for many years, but I have helped raise funds for the sabs i think it's I, I i think it's something positive and you know what we're talking about tonight it isn't disputing all these ways of campaigning you know for animals aren't positive it, it, it's not a question of 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 good and bad it's really a question of good and better isn't it that these things are good but is there like an even better way of doing things that's that's how i'd put it well, there's no, there's no guarantees. Uh, in, in, you know, kind of, if if you, as it were, um, educate someone and they go vegan, they start to live vegan, there's no guarantee that they're they're going to fully embrace the philosophy of veganism, and there's no guarantee that they're not going to, you know, stop, especially if they initially do it for health reasons. So no. there's there's no there's no guarantees, and then and then in terms of the pressure campaigns. It's kind of even more treacherous in the sense that to, to actually close something down, it's it's difficult to know actually what what that has achieved hmm. because there's all kind of variables that could happen. Yeah, but, I, I, I mean, I you know obviously um, kind of moved on from the Sabs and um, got involved with the Band of Mercy that became the Animal Liberation Front. I still did both at the same time for a while, but eventually I kind of just totally concentrated on ALF stuff, and I was a you know press officer for a number of years, and um, we closed places down, we closed laboratories down through constantly 
like attacking them. And these were, there was a couple in London that closed um, that were contract research laboratories, rather like Huntington Life Sciences, where companies pay them um, to test their products. Uh, and these are often not not just um, not just drugs, but you know household products. And I think in those days they'd probably be cosmetics and and all sorts. Um, and we closed those places down. And of course, you know th this this was heralded as a great victory. But you see, if that didn't have the effect of actually reducing the number of experiments, if if that didn't have the effect of reducing the demand those companies that previously had used those contract testing laboratories would just go and get their products tested at another contract testing laboratory. So, so it kind of, although we heard it as a victory, it may very well not have been the victory that it seemed in ter terms well, of sparing. Well, you know, actually, though, there, there yeah. was a couple of cases where um, a, a lot of, um, and this is almost like damage to documents, ironically, um, that you know you you could as as it were just destroy like twenty five years worth of of work that couldn't be done again. Whereas if you're talking about toxicology, it'll just be a question of well we'll we'll go to X rather than than Y then instead. Whereas if you've got a specialist research facility and you do manage to kind of um, I mean, I don't even know if it would work nowadays in the computer age. I mean, you know, that was that was when everything was filed in paper and all that kind of stuff, and so they they lost their research. So, so that that would have been that would have been much more of a significant thing. I would have thought. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I I I, I think the um, the the main achievement really of the Animal Liberation Front didn't lie in closing down any any particular any particular laboratory. I think it kind of, you know, the achievement was in forcing an overall reduction in the number of experiments. Um, like I've said before, that when, um, when when it kind of all started in the mid-70s, uh, the number of animal experiments every year, I mean, according to official home office figures anyway, was somewhere above six million. And 10 years later, that had fallen to, I think, below 3 million. So there'd been a reduction of, you know, 3 million experiments annually. Um, and and there, there was nothing going on at the time that that could explain that, really, apart from direct action. There was no legislation or change of regulations or anything. There was some legislation in 1986 that might have created a very small reduction in ex animal experiments but in those inter 10, 10 years uh, there wasn't anything in you know yeah well like that be, be, before i say something about that i just want to point out to uh, bc that i i have clocked that question we'll, we'll come back to it uh, a, a little later so um yeah i mean that's we'll, we'll, that, 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 that yeah that yeah, is we'll, an interesting one we'll um, get to that uh, but yeah, because um, also also animal use is a globalized industry so if it was going down in Britain, it doesn't necessarily mean that those ones weren't being transferred abroad, does it? Um, not necessarily. But I think I, I think it would be fair to say um, that the ALF did have um, some effect in reducing the number of experiments. Oh, yeah. I mean, and, I, and, and that we'd have we're, we're in danger yeah. of almost like saying, yeah, what we did then and what other people did was a waste of time. We're not yeah, yeah, no. I, well. I, and, 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 and I think, um, yeah, and, 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 and also with the fur trade, um, you know, the campaign against the, 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 the fur trade that the ALF carried out um, kind of decimated the, fur, the, the, the retail fur industry. You know, it it, it it was a situation like we had um, department stores all over the country had fur departments, and they were, you know, they, they were there were fur shops everywhere. You know, it, it, every every town really cities had several fur shops, and every town had a fur shop. I, I I lived in a suburb of North London, and there was a fur shop around the corner from me, just in a side street. The, these places were kind of everywhere, and mm. all that. All that disappeared, and you know now we have a situation where the only department store that sells 
has a fur department uh, is Harrods in London. Bill Harrods, yeah. Uh, but, and the but, only what does it the, mean, though, Ronnie? If you say that um, most of the stores, the department stores, took took their fur departments out, so it's yes. a franchise situation. So Michael Edelson, for example, would would have all these fur departments all over the country. So they so they got booted out and said, okay, we're not going to rent, rent you any space. But what does it mean? Well, you see, the thing you see, I, th I think, I think with fur, that you know, some of it is sold. You know, if someone's determined to get a fur coat, they can still get one because you can get them online, and you can go to places where you can go and look at furs, like behind locked doors, and they have these places sometimes on industrial estates, but they're not high street places. You know, you make an appointment and you go there and you, you do it that way. So I was determined to get a fur coat. Yeah, they're going to do it that way. But I think because they're not so readily available, I think that has led to a reduction in demand. And, and I, I don't think that can be denied, really, that there's been a reduction of demand, you know, be, 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 because of it being much more difficult to get a fur coat. And I think, you know, and, and, and I would accept that. Um, but you see how I came to kind of the conclusion that the most vital thing um, for animal liberation was vegan education was kind of um, was really kind of looking at how things developed in terms of the direct action movement. Because, of course, what happened in the end was that it was crushed by the state, that as soon as it started kind of becoming really successful and like really threatening you know like the state moved in and in in various ways crushed that movement and that and that, is, that wasn't just the case really with you know just without and out you know direct action movements like the ALF um, but also with groups like Shack and Speak um, where the, the people involved in those groups ended up sentenced to long periods of imprisonment because the state, you know, they employed special squads to hunt down animal liberationists, particularly anti-vivisectionists. Um, well, one of the worst things, though, Ronnie, is the fact that um, they're all out now, but they're, they're, they're not anywhere because I think it's part of their being, you know, part of their parole that they're not allowed to be active right so they've, they've uh, yeah like I, 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 I think it, from I a think campaign it kind of varies so, i mean um I, I i think there might be restrictions in terms of anti vivisection campaigning on some of them but i know certainly some of them campaign on other issues so mm. it's not it's not you know across that, the board that would that'd be, that'd be horrible wouldn't it if if you got released and got told that you couldn't do any more campaigning for the rest of your life that would be that would be so horrible yeah, well, well, some of them had stuff fairly close to that. I mean, certainly, I think in terms of animal experimentation, but I think I don't know whether these were life bans or whether it was for a period of time. I don't know exactly, and and I think it varied from person to person. So, so this is quite draconian stuff. And the other things they did was they brought in in new laws, and they kind of twisted existing laws like blackmail, used that against people, and because blackmail was never meant to be used against any vivisection campaigners, was it? You know. Um, and they did all these things to kind of crush that, you know, to crush the movement. And that kind of started me thinking, well, look, you know, if we're all, if, if, if these, if, if that type of action is, is always going to come up against the rocks of the state, in other words, that, yeah, it achieves a certain amount, right? But once it starts getting successful beyond the, a particular particular point and particularly with powerful industries like the vivisection industry you know that's obviously linked to the far you know the, the pharmaceutical industry that have you know huge sway with the type of government we have at the moment right then the state is going to move in like they did you know the state moved in to support hunting and life sciences didn't it like they were given yeah. bank it of begs, england begs a question here. i'm gonna ask yeah. you to speculate here ronnie yeah if um vegan education on the demand side gets um the amount of vegans up to 20 25 percent or 15 percent or whatever uh, wouldn't wouldn't the state move in on that side as well it would be more it, it would be 
I think it'd be a lot more difficult. I think it'd be a lot more difficult. I mean, the thing is that the, it's kind of easy for them because to it, because it's legal. It's find an excuse to you know kind of mm. crack down on people that they can, um, you know that that are you know causing uh, criminal damage and stuff like that. You know, of course. Um, but you know, car carrying on from what I was saying, you see. So I thought, well, look, you know, what's going to happen if we if we're ever going to achieve animal liberation you know animal liberation is a widespread situation where other animals are no longer oppressed by humans that's that's kind of what what we want right and you know like yes i mean the alf you know before the state cracked down and everything you know the alf i would say spared maybe tens of millions of um other animals from suffering the slaughter you know, and that, and, and I was proud to be part of that, and proud to be in at the beginning of that. You know, that's, you know, you know, that's kind of <laughs> that was a far better road for me to go down than what I would, you know, how my life was going to be before that, which was that I was working in a solicitor's office and I'd become a solicitor and had a big house and, you know, just, you know, not contributed, you know, anything towards kind of radical, you know, progressive change in society, um, and. So, so for me, that was a really positive thing. So I'm very proud of that. I was involved in that and that played a part in despairing of, you know, you know, so many other animals. Um, but nevertheless, you know, if we if we look at what you know, that that's a drop in the ocean compared with the amount of suffering and slaughter of, of of other animals that actually exists. I mean, you know, in the, in the UK, you know, people in the UK consume eight eight billion eight billion animals are slaughtered every year to to feed people in 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 the uk all right and and you know even if you look at just animal experiments all right that was you know it was it was great that so many animals were spared from that by the alf but it was still you know <coughs> nowhere near the number that actually are experimented on you see so just in that you know in in that limited area of the oppression of other animals it kind of didn't it, it didn't come anywhere near getting rid of the whole thing you see and i thought well look um what we have to do you know we, we, the only way that we can achieve animal liberation is actually to to prevent the state from doing that to prevent the state from taking action right and so kind of how 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 do you do that how how do you change the nature of the administration so that it becomes sympathetic to animal liberation and so you know how do we get these administrations that constantly all the time are like um are, are speciesist um and you know obviously they're not <laughs> they, they've never been great as far as, uh, as as humans are concerned but in terms of other animals you know, it's just it's, you know. Well, you, you give you give them a million quid each, don't you? That's what it is. <laughs> yeah, that that'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you see, so so therefore, and and and, and they they're voted in by ordinary people. You know, we've got we've got the government we've got now, the horrific government we've got now. They were they were voted in by almost thirty percent of of um, you know people eligible to vote. You see, so unless you change. Unless you change ordinary people, unless you change the fundamental mindset of, of, a, of a substantial number of ordinary people, you're never going to change the nature of the administration and you're never going to get an administration that's sympathetic to animal liberation. So you'll always get an administration that's going to crack down on direct action as soon as direct action looks like yeah, it's going to come we're anywhere we're near being successful. To, yeah, we're trying, we're trying to change the, the culture. Yeah, but, trying to change the culture, to, yeah. Just, just to bring it back a little bit, Ronnie, to the movement now, I want to first off just start with um, what BC says and then link in to what um, Colleen said earlier, because from a movement point of view, if we want to do anything, we've, we've got to um, kind of uh, G people up in order to, to do it. And so there's a kind of social psychology here as well. And so obviously um, the big kind of actions and the illegal kind of stuff, it, it did get a lot of support from a certain set of activists who were inspired by all that, right? And if it had been, as it were, Francis dream, 
and the just be vegan education right from the start, maybe, and this is a almost a terrible thing to say, um, because this is what Colleen says here, is maybe that's just not exciting enough. I, I think there is an element of that. I, 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 I think the problem is that people don't <clears throat> take time to analyze the action effect of their actions. And, and, and I think people tend to, to, to kind of have a feeling that, um, that, the, that the kind of impact on themselves in doing an action somehow transfers to other people. In other words, if something's emotional, that's going to be more effective than something that that isn't you know and i think that, that there is that you know there is that kind of confusion in people because they haven't sort of sat down and thought well hang on a minute what is the actual effect of this analyze what the actual effect of this action is going to be <clears throat> you see and I, 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 I don't think that kind of happens because i think people are um are kind of controlled by emotion. I think it's all right to be driven by emotion. I mean, I'm very much driven by emotion in terms of fueling, you know, it, that it fuels me to constantly, you know, campaign. Um, so that's okay. It's all right to be driven by emotion. But if you're controlled by emotion, if 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 that if it prevents you from like analyzing what the effect of your action is going to be, then that can that can lead people to, to do things that aren't aren't the best that aren't the most effective it's an in... interesting distinction isn't it you know being controlled by uh, rather than driven by it, it is quite yes interesting. Yeah, yeah 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 i think that's you know, the, and, and i think that's that's the difficulty because you sort of see people i mean you get these people that go outside like we'll go outside a slaughterhouse that's kind of maybe pretty much in the middle of nowhere and kind of hold boards and stuff and you think well how is that you know how's that changing anything you know how does that but it makes them you know they're they're feeling stuff emotionally they're seeing the animals going in they're being upset they may be shouting they've got a megaphone and all that and it's it's a high high emotional thing for them but in fact the Im impact of that on the outside world is negligible whereas somebody quietly delivering vegan leaflets through people's letter boxes or you know have having an, an an information stall or you know giving leaflets out on the street that's likely to have far more impact in actually kind of changing people and eventually you know changing enough people so that we can kind of ch change the culture of society and we can change the type of administration we have mm, i think um i think i think deb deb is onto something here in the sense that i think our position is that if if direct action, open rescues, et cetera, et cetera, saves, we're all connected very tightly to education on the street, uh, widespread ed education, Th then, then that would, in theory, um, do the trick in, in, in the sense that, you know, you might think, okay, well, you're, you're part of the kind of save um, situation you only need to go to the slaughterhouses once every three months but and the rest of the time you can take the photographs and film on that to the street that makes sense to me mm. go, going to the slaughterhouses every week or or however frequently it's done uh, doesn't make sense to me mm. see, see I, th I think i think direct action can have an educational effect you, 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 you see, the, the, the kind of word I'd use to me, a very important word, I've said this numerous times before, a very important word for me is the word unless. It's the word unless. In, in I think all these actions have a value. You know, direct action has a value. Hunt, sabotage has a value. Animal rescue has a value. Animal sanctuaries have a value. Um, all, all these have a things have a value in, in improving the situation for other animals, right? And 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 these are all things I support. These are all things that I take a part of. These are all things I've fundraised for, right? But unless unless we have a huge amount of vegan education, we won't achieve animal liberation. So it's an unless. It's the, the, these other things are great. But unless we have enough people involved in outreach, we're not going to get any further than just snatching a few animals to safety. 
We're never going to get a widespread situation of animal liberation unless we have a very large amount of education. And that means if we're going to have a, a, a large amount of vegan education, it means far more vegans need to be involved in it. Otherwise, that's not going to happen. So it's, it's so, so it's that it's unless that happens, unless that mm. happens, we're not we're not going to do it. C Colleen is is raising the, the Wayne Sean recent thing uh, and saying that that got a lot of publicity. <laughs> Yeah. And um, I mean, that that ironically was um, deliberately flouting the law. Wasn't yeah. It? yeah. You, you see, I think it, this is an example of, of, of where direct action can sometimes have a strong edu educational effect. And this is an example of that, you know, that you can through the publicity you get through a direct action, you can educate people and that will no doubt have educated a lot you know a lot of people to 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 go vegan or to you know to to consider it you know and and i, I think the same with the animal rebellion actions although they're kind of messaging sometimes is a little bit you know they don't it, it's kind of more environmentalist than animal liberationist a lot of the time um i think their actions you know the the, the actions they took um last september where they blockaded the dairies and and the um or, you know the the dairy supply depots and the publicity that came out of that i think that that had a strong educational effect you know in term of, of terms of um uh persuading people to become vegan so i think that that yes that that that, that direct action can be you know you can, can be useful in that way um and be kind of much more effective in that sense than it is in in kind of what its stated purpose might be. In other words, the animal rebellion. You know, their stated purpose was like, you know, we 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 somehow want to pressurise the government to kind of, you know, move, you know, you know, move agriculture to, uh, you know, to a plant based system. You know, that's that's kind of what their stated <laughs> their stated aim wasn't anything to do with education. It was that, which is kind of with this government, it's like, you know. <laughs> it's kind of highly unlikely, isn't it? Sadly, um, wh whereas the, the, you know the most important effect of their action and the main effect of their action was educational, and I think it's the same with you know these open rescues that you know that DXC have done in the states. You know whatever that whatever the kind of stated aim of those actions, I think the main effect that you know the most important effect and the main effect of them is 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 education. Yeah, you said earlier, um, uh, then direct action doesn't often achieve education, but um, I mean that's how that's how I thought, isn't it? The move, the well, well I, I think it kind, I think it kind of depends on the type of direct action, and I think the the type of direct action going on now is kind of much more likely to have a, a an education effect than the type of direct action we did. Because the type of direct action where we did, which like was a low, you know, did a lot of damage, and then we, you know, there was an image of people in balaclavas, and we kind of, we didn't hang around to be arrested. We <laughs> we ran away to fight another day. There was that that type of, you know, that that was that was, you know, how we did it. Well, it certainly is difficult to um, bring a, a radio or TV um interview around to vegan education from when they start with the t word isn't it so yeah, uh, yeah. i mean that's yeah. the thing it, and, and and so of course but but you see if you've got people you're going into a place coming out with piglets or coming out with beagles and saying here i am you know i've done nothing wrong here i am arrest me you know i've rescued this animal because you know you know it's it's appalling that they should be imprisoned in these places etc cetera, etc cetera. then that is much likely to get more favorable publicity and those people are going to be given much more of a voice in the media so the education effect of that type of direct action is actually much greater than that than it was with what we did yeah i mean i mean really that you could almost like see open rescue as a kind of mid midway type situation because it is illegal but um it's pretty small beer compared with, with yeah. what went on but, with but, it but it's still the case. But you see, never, nevertheless, you know, it, it kind of <coughs> the important aspect of it, the most important as aspect of it, in my opinion, is the educational aspect. So we're still talking about education. We're still talking about the importance of education in terms of changing, you know, you know, the, 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 
the way the the way the way people think, the way people operate, you know, both you know, both in terms of their you know their diet and lifestyle, which then has an impact, but also in terms of the way those people operate politically. You see, and that you know, all that's vitally important. And the most important thing to me about these actions is the educational effect. So it's all it's kind of all part of it's all part of the same thing. It's all part of that that educational effort. But the 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 ironic thing though, Ronnie, is that you've told the story that you were involved with ALF type things because you you didn't particularly want to talk to the public. Yeah. And then you, yeah. you ended up talking to the public yes. because it was almost like foisted on you, wasn't it? Well, yeah, yeah, because what happened, I, I didn't want anything to do with the public. You know, I just wanted to because you see the ALF was like a direct war between you know the activists and the people who oppressed animals the public were nowhere in it the public were just on the sidelines you know they weren't it didn't involve the public at all um and that's how we saw it and 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 we kind of saw it like we, we want to knock these people out we want to cause these people so much damage that they go out of business and I think we had this idea that, like, okay, well, we'll start off, we'll destroy the fur trade, we'll destroy the river section industry, and then we'll move on to the big one and we'll destroy the, you know, the meat industry and the dairy industry. That was kind of, we kind of sort of believe, it's, it's kind of crazy now thinking back the naivety of it, that we actually thought that, you know, that that, that was our battle plan, you know. And but, it kind of got in, away with it for a while at first, and it kind of yeah, encouraged In the us. early days, before you were forced into it, you must have had a talk about how can we get press out of this? Or can we pass it on to the national groups to for them to do it? We, we'll just do the stuff, pass on whatever we get. But, of course, obviously, if you do damage, there's not, not too much to pass on. But, you know, but certain things like pictures and stuff. Yeah, I mean... The, the, you see, the damage was more was was more. I mean, I I was much more into the damage than the animal rescue. You see, because the the idea was we're gonna we're gonna just cause these people so much economic loss they're forced out of business and and it ends the industry. That's 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 kind of what we thought. So it was a complete war behind the backs of so the it was public. a complete war, and 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 so and and so it was kind of really, you know, the the the, the, the kind of kind of explaining anything to the public certainly kind of in the early days i suppose or for a while wasn't wasn't in it it wasn't in it it was just like we're just gonna you know cause so much damage to these people that go out of business and so public opinion doesn't matter because you know we'll 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 raise such a force against this industry that they, they won't be able to operate and yeah, I mean, that's kind explains, of <laughs> yeah i mean it explains why when there was a press office suddenly some of the activists still didn't want to use it because they didn't see the point because the public yes, wasn't because the yeah. ethos, it wasn't about the public it wasn't about educating the public it was about directly you know causing economics but but the thing is you know when, when you look on um back on it that was naive in the extreme you know is the state really gonna let you get away with that you know and when you've got a state that's kind of you know um speciesist because you know those people that run it have been voted in by by a public that's largely speciesist in themselves. So you know, it's crazy. It was night. It was it was kind of like it was sort of naive in, in the extreme. But we did. It, well, certainly I, you know, at the time thought, yeah, we can. We're on a roll. We, we yeah, can we, actually, can, we can. We can, we can win. Yeah, and I, I, I remember getting caught up in all, in all that. Yeah, 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 so, yeah. So if if we kind of workshop this and say, okay, let's. Let's imagine in an ideal type situation that we can start again. So direct action would still happen, but it would be tied to education straight away. Is that is that what you're saying? Yes. I, I mean, I think you, you see um, vegan education, um, I mean, certainly here in the UK, it's only really been going back 25 years Um probably the mid mid 1990s when people started doing the vegan fairs and stuff you know like london vegan london vegan um fair i think it was at the time um was one of the first ones it was very you know really grassroots um uh, it was a gra grassroots event very good um those things started and um you know, then people start going out on the street and spreading the message, and you know that's 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 continued. That that's been going twenty five years now. In, in the history of the animal rights movement, that's only, you know, 
if you say, well, the animal rights movement really began in the 1970s, right? And then before that, you had for decades and decades what, what might be called an animal protection movement. It's in the history of both those things that the the um, vegan education, vegan outreach is only really quite recent. And, and I kind of think that had that started, in, instead of starting 25 years ago, had that started 50 years ago in the 70s, how much further would we be on now? We, we've got now in terms of public education and in terms of, of, of raising awareness amongst the public. That yeah, even exactly. you've, got, you've got you've got to factor in the social psychology that we spoke about a quarter of an hour ago, because maybe not a lot of people would have got involved because it wasn't kind of, you know, it wasn't. It would have been it would have been slow at first. But, you know, that 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 kind of often is you know, how these things start, the, the, the number of vegans you'd get in the beginning would be, be very small and then that would gradually rise. And then once it, 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 it kind of reaches a tipping point, doesn't it? And then it goes up much more quickly. Yeah, but I mean, I think, Ronnie, isn't that, could that be a fact, factor, do you think, in the modern day vegan movement? You've got people who, for a whole variety of reasons, won't want to do illegal stuff because they can't take the risk. But something's still stopping them doing the easier yeah, and no, stuff we're, that they. We're, 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 we're back to the kind of we're, we're back to the um, we're back to the kind of big question because you see, although um, all, all, all that you know, th there are people that choose to do other things. There are activists that choose to do other things apart from vegan education. You know, there there are people that focus on section there are people that focus on hunt sabotage and that but in a sense it's kind of <laughs> in a very big sense it's not those people that are the problem it's not those people that are the problem what the problem is is all the vegans that aren't active that's the big problem and <coughs> um, it, it's a question of like you know kind of how do we get more of those people active in um but, but there in is vegan another outreach? There is another tandem problem, which is which is if the people who are are willing to be active are, are doing things that are, are not very effective, or even you know uh, you know I I would say there's a couple of things that's going on that are not effective at all. That that is a complete waste of talent at that stage. So we've got the problem of not being able to recruit the inactive vegans. And then you've got a slice of the activi activists going off and doing stuff which arguably is not the best thing to be done. So that's two problems in tandem, isn't it? Yeah, it, it, yes, it, 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 it kind of is. But you'd nevertheless, <coughs> you'd nevertheless need to get a lot more vegans <coughs> um, to be active in outreach if we were going to kind of reach the amount of outreach that we need in order to really change things. And I think that kind of, <coughs> in, in a sense, that kind of comes back to how outreach is done. Because um, what happens really um, these days with vegan outreach is that it, it, it tends to take place in the centre of big cities, um, where you get things like, uh, you know, the Cuba Truth, or you get, uh, you know, maybe We the Free, um, and other other groups doing that type of activity used to be Earthlings. I don't know whether that's still going. It used to be Earthlings. Yeah, yeah. I, I saw some Earthling stuff this week. Yeah, and these and these things go in, and they're in the centre, of, like they're in the middle of Manchester, in Bristol. You know, you know, in Piccadilly Circus in London, and you know, they, and and that's great. And not, a, I think it's brilliant that that's happening. I'm not against that at all. It's, it's brilliant. But we've got so many other places where there's no outreach taking place. You know, we have smaller cities, we have smaller towns, the suburbs of cities, you know, even villages where there's nothing and nothing goes on. And a lot of the, these people that kind of go into the big cities live in outlying areas. They actually live in places where there's no outreach, you see. And, and um, I'd say what needs to happen, we, you know, we need to stimulate outreach in those other areas right and so 
you know, I, I, I would say to those activists that are going and taking part in the cities doing the outreach, think about your own area. I'm not saying don't go into the city because these things don't take place every week in, in, in cities, do they? They're used every so often. Think about what you can do in your own area, because you see, the thing is that, that there's an un untapped, uh, there's an untapped potential amongst vegans, because um, I think there, there, there are a lot of vegans that wouldn't go into the city, wouldn't go into their nearest city, say, travel um, to do Cuba Truth and to do um, stuff like that, but would do stuff in their local area, perhaps in a more low key way. I mean, in our local vegan group, we've got... Um, We've got maybe half a dozen people who'll deliver leaflets and sometimes help at information stores. They never go in. They never go to, you know, our, yeah, our nearest big cities. Birmingham. The, never, the, evidence, there. the evidence isn't there to support that. It's it's um, it's the fact that they're they're not they're not there. Otherwise, you know, they there would be stuff happening in the in the suburbs a lot more well, than the the the, 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 re, the reason why. The, the, the reason why stuff isn't happening in in these kind of uh, smaller areas is is, is because th there's no one stimulating it. There's no one encouraging the the vegans that live in these local areas to get active, and so they don't. And and this is the key thing. That's why I was always saying that the, in in a, in a sense, the the key to us being able to do enough outreach lies in. Um, in people becoming local organisers or, or, or local stimulators of action in in all these local areas, for people, you know, for you know, to have one or two people in these local areas saying, right, I'm going to, you know, start outreach off here, you know, where I live in this in this town or this suburb of this city, and I'm going to recruit, do my best to recruit vegans that live here to join me, and 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 help me do this. And, and it's down to these. Um, I mean, we had a, we did a show, didn't we, a while back called Quest for the Golden Vegans, which was about this. It was about the importance of these local organisers. And, and to me, that's key. That is the one key thing. If someone said, what is the key thing that's needed if we're going to achieve animal liberation? I'd, I'd say we need, the, the, you know, we need these people in all these local areas that will stimulate outreach and get other local vegans in, involved in outreach. Because a lot of those vegans that would be involved in that type of outreach wouldn't be the ones going into the big cities and, and, and doing the other stuff, you see. So you're able to recruit a lot more. But by, by that method, you're able to recruit a lot more vegans into, uh, into so doing outreach. So where, where would you, if you were to ask, uh, be asked where where would you start with that what would you do first well <clears throat> i i think that kind of it's it, it's it, it's 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 finding people in 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 i mean first of all to say to you know to people that are already active that are already kind of going into the big cities and doing stuff to say to them think about can you stimulate outreach where you actually live and get together with vegans where we actually live to, to get some outreach going. You know, that's a, that you know that would be the first thing. But then we need to fit, find other people other than them. We we need to find vegans that have never done outreach to kind of start doing it, to start becoming organisers in their own local area. And and I think what would be, <clears throat> you know, what I'd love to see is 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 people kind of employed to to do this. I'd love to see people employed in maybe in the regions to kind of be hands-on in kind of getting outreach going in all the local towns around them, you know, to kind of find people and encourage people and help people to get outreach going in their local area. But that would obviously mean that, you know, funding would need to come from somewhere. To, yeah, to, if only there was a million quid floating around somewhere. That yeah, we could or if some, of the, if some of the national organisations, you know, if the national groups that promote veganism were to get together and say, you know, mm. if, if they were to recognise the importance of this, if they were to understand that this, this is the one most vitally important thing, you know, for the achievement of animal liberation, if they, if they were to kind of understand that and say, right, we're, you know, we're going to get together and we're going to, you know, we're, we're, we're going to employ these people to kind of actually do that. I think that would be a huge step forward.
and and hopefully <laughs> there might be some of them you know listening to this that kind of might start thinking about doing it because that's you know that that would that would that would be kind of hugely helpful or yeah, someone who's got a load of money you know we got wealthy v we never had wealthy vegans did we when we were <laughs> back in the day but now there seems to be these kind of <laughs> these mysterious donors they're called the donor aren't they you know they are yeah they're kind no, of giving I... this money if, if we had a Blood, donor, donor, but um yeah. yeah yeah it's an interesting one now we come, we're coming up on the hour so um we had a film ready but i think we can probably leave that now running because we might have gone past that, uh, that yeah issue, i think yes um but... so do we want to go back to the question that we're not going to ignore which is this one a question for Ronnie and Roger: What made you go vegan? Uh, now you're going to you're going to talk about your sister and the vegetarian. Uh, now. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> well, with me, I mean, I mean, it's kind of very much based on me, you know, going vegetarian because it was through being vegetarian that I went vegan, and that's probably the case. Well, I don't know so much these days, but it certainly was the case, you know, back then, because veganism wasn't really heard of i mean i hadn't really heard of vegetarianism let alone veganism and my my sister's first husband when she started going out with him he was a he was a vegetarian and that's what got me to become vegetarian and i was vegetarian for two and a half years and i picked up a copy of the vegetarian society's magazine it was in a health food store and there was an article in about veganism and that kind of really you know opened my eyes i wasn't aware i just thought cows had to be milked and hens laid eggs in the fields you know i didn't know this <laughs> you know what happened to, to you know the cows and the calves and the hens and the chicks or anything and i was like horrified i thought this is far worse than i ever imagined you know because there was stuff in there as well about vivisection and stuff about the fur trade and i thought this is this is horrific and i have to i have to really get involved in doing something about this and so i um, this article, I think, was from someone from the Vegan Society. So I got in touch with the Vegan Society and, you know, they sent me information and, you know, I've become vegan re really quickly. So it was just I didn't know. I mean, I think at, at the time I became vegetarian and I'd been aware of, you know, the, you know, the, the, the suffering sort of caused by the dairy industry and the egg industry. I, at that time, I, I wouldn't have just become vegetarian. I would have become vegan. It was only that I wasn't aware of it. Yeah, there's a really, there's a really kind of weird, almost ironic part of your story, Ronnie, which is the fact that, um, and of course we would kind of push against this now, is that, is that you were impressed by the health of the vegetarian? Uh, well, it, you, what it, what that's it was, not the reason you did it. It's that just wasn't that, the reason I did it. What, no. what, it, what it was was was, um, I think it's kind of quite important in a way. Was that. Um, Stephen, that was my, um, um, it was my sister's boyfriend at the time. Um, he um, he was really healthy. He'd been a vegan, a vegan. He'd been a vegetarian um, since, since since quite a young boy, and uh, he was he represented the county athletics. He was really fit and healthy. You see, and 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 what that did was stop me finding an excuse not to be vegetarian. You see, because I was I was a huge meat eater. I, I kind of, I mean, I sucked the marrow out of bones and ate bacon rind and that. I was kind of appalling, you know. Um, and so I kind of, it, you know, obviously, you know, played on my mind that here's this guy that's, here's this guy that's vegetarian. And, and, and I was trying to find an excuse to carry on eating meat, you see. And I think if this guy, instead of this guy being healthy, if he'd been like half dead, then that would have been my excuse. I'd have said, yeah, well, but if, if, if that had been the Internet age, you'd have been the one on the Internet going, oh, these vegans, they're not healthy. They're pale and they're skinny and all that. Right. And and, and it, it was the fact that you came across somebody who kind of broke that stereotype. It stopped. Well, it stopped me finding an excuse. It stopped me finding, an excuse. Yeah. you know, that was what it was. That wasn't the reason. The reason I wanted to be but the, the reason I was thinking about being vegetarian was to do the animals and, and not wanting you know the animals to be slaughtered that was the reason that was kind of what what kind of played on my mind and on my conscience you see but because i you know was big into eating meat i kind of a big part of me wanted to carry on doing it and so i was trying to find an excuse to kind of carry on and i i you know i kind of fear that if he'd been really if 
this guy had been really unhealthy, that might have given me an excuse to think, oh, well, we're meant to eat meat because, look, he's, he, you know, he's half dead type thing. Which is kind of one of the reasons why I think we should, you know, we as vegans should try to be healthy. You know, so people that can't use that excuse. But that, but that, um, that this gets us into difficult territory here because mm. this, this idea that um, I mean, some people have promoted veganism as almost like a, a cure all for mm. for every ail, ailment that you yeah. can think of, and also there are some vegans who are sick, and we shouldn't we shouldn't um, kind of deny uh, their kind of role in the movement either. Right. And so it does put us into a bit of a difficult thing, you know, like it's not everybody's going to look like, you know, hench herbivore or something, you know. So. No, I think I think I think that's true. And, and I think, you know, <clears throat> there are vegans that are real, but it's nothing to do with veganism. You know, that, that people kind of, you know, vegans still, can still become ill. Obviously, you know, we're not we're not like kind of immune from stuff. But I think if you eat the. Consume a healthy vegan diet. I, just I think the real. Mm, I think the real key to it is that you don't, you don't kind of make the claim that vegans can't become ill. No, no, not yeah. at all. No, so, it's just yeah. I think if, if 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 someone eats a healthy vegan diet, it does give you more of a chance. That's you know we're not all dealt the same thing genetically, are we? For instance, no. It's, I mean, obviously the health bits are a, a, a bonus. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I used to describe it as that. I think I think it can be a little bit nuanced, but um yeah. Um over the hour. Um in terms of my story, I um I was influenced by my sister and um but she was a conservationist mainly. And um she used to have th these um envelopes on, on the mantelpiece where she was collecting money for the tiger appeal and the elephant appeal and this kind of stuff. And um it coincided with a, a, a scandal involving the RSPCA, where the director um, paid paid himself a massive amount in order to to put some plush uh, carpeting in his office or something. So there was that, and so I started to wonder what what was happening to my sister's money on the mantelpiece. And then I saw an advert for the Hunt Saboteurs, and they weren't asking for money; they were asking for action. And I thought. Ah well, this is the solution. Then I was I was interested, but I was wary about you know doing doing the best thing really. And as soon as they say, well, we don't want your money, we want your action. I thought, well, that's the thing for me. And so that's 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 the kind of core to it, mm. you know, that 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 got involved in in terms of underlying values. I think when I was a kid, I always um, had this value about what was fair and what wasn't fair. You know, there's a couple of instances uh, very briefly. I mean, I remember at school jumping from desk to desk, letting trying to let wasps out, and everybody else was trying to kill them. You know? And you know, the same when I when I first got a job, you know, people people would would try to kill insects who were flying around and stuff. And I was thinking, you know, why do you do that? That's just not fair. You know, it was it was it was something. Like that. And I, I suppose it all congealed then, all this kind of my sister's conservation, the action thing and the fairness thing all congealed into what became veganism, I suppose, in the end. Mm. And also, yeah, the, yeah. yeah, the fact that I um, I came across uh, Tom Reagan's work in the, you know, 1983, that, that had a big thing because it almost, um, in the same way as a lot of people say this about animal liberation, but the case kind of gave me an argument that fitted what I was feeling. Mm. So it was, re it was really good in that sense. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean, thinking back, I mean, I, I took action a few times, you know, before I was even vegan or even vegetarian, I, I, I took action a few times to protect animals in my early life, protect other animals. Um, and uh, so maybe there was kind of something in me anyway. But it's interesting that you kind of, that, you know, there are people that um, become vegan through involvement in um, in action or involvement in campaigning. Um, I mean, for instance, in our when I was involved in running a hunt sub group in North London in the 19, 1970s, late 1970s, um, you know, we at the time that the, the hunt subs were was. Uh, um, getting a lot of recruits we were getting a lot of recruits to, to our group in particular and and 
invariably they wouldn't be vegan or even vegetarian. And uh, when they found out we were vegan, they say, I'm not interested in that. We just want to save the fox. I like my meat. And it was that kind of thing. But almost all of them within just a couple of weeks, a few weeks of them being involved became vegan because we explained to them why we were vegan and they took it on board. And so we, we managed to educate a, a, a lot of hunt sabs to go vegan. And I think that's often used, uh, that's often used as like a kind of, um, by people who favor, um, people who favor pressure campaigning over vegan education. They'll say, oh, well, yeah, but pressure campaigning is a way of educating people to become vegan. This is how we educate people to become vegan through pressure campaigning because people join the campaign and then they become vegan, right? And and there is truth in that. But the problem is that's only going to be a really tiny percentage of the population because only a tiny percentage of the population is going to be involved in pressure campaigning. What about all the rest of the population that isn't going to be involved in pressure campaigning? You see, we've got to go out there and educate those people for them to be vegan, if you see what I mean. Yeah, see, but so I mean, there's, the, a, there's yeah. a major advantage in, in creating vegans who, who are activists rather than people who are vegan. And then you've got to go through the next step of going, OK, so what about a bit of activism? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, these people, you know, the people that we turned vegan um, to hunt sabs didn't become become vegan outreachers they they were hunt sabs who were vegan mm. basically um but you see but, but you know, what i'm saying ronnie though is yeah. that the, all those non-active vegans that we've talked about yeah there's probably more of those than there are people doing pressure campaigns oh yeah massively more there's massively more of those yeah but it's, it's huge, bit, huge numbers but, yeah um, but that's not doing any good though is it apart well, from it, what they're it, doing in terms of their their micro it, it kind, kind of, of we we need to we need to kind of you know have a process whereby more of those vegans that are encouraged to become active and 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 you know this is why I talk about community outreach and people stimulating um, vegan outreach in their local community because a, a a lot of people will do outreach in their local community that kind kind of won't do it elsewhere you know they'll do mm. simple outreach like you know people do where I am, you know, they're delivering, delivering yeah, leaflets or, you know. I, I, want, I want to just to, to, to wrap up a little bit, but there's a couple yeah. of things first. Uh, Joanna is talking about uh, McDonald's and KFC, so we'll come back to that. But Colleen said before, and I put it up before, this thing about um, junk food vegans, in, in, your, in your kind of story, um, it kind of uh, it could be deleterious towards veganism. If we're going to get a generation of people who There's maybe a, 20 years down the line, they might they might have junk food related. Well, well, yeah, problems. I mean, I think this, you know, this is this is kind of <clears throat> I think this is a problem. Um, I mean, it's difficult. It's a difficult one to no negotiate, though. Yeah, it's there were occasional junk food vegans, but I knew one one guy who was uh, <clears throat> involved in hunt sabs and he lived on beer and chips and claimed to be vegan now. Presumably that would mean the beer and chips would need it to be vegan, but it was possible even in oh, those Did, he, did he dip the chips into the beer? <laughs> Maybe he did, yeah. But that's what he lived on, beer, 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 beer and chips. Now, that's not a hell. That's the kind of... You know, well, maybe, maybe he got the chips from KFC and uh, yeah. things. So, uh, I mean, this is um, an interesting uh, generational yeah. thing, that's, isn't it? Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Now, now there's like... Um, I did a um I, I did a series um of discussions with um Wendy Shahata, who's um one of the people that runs the Hoglitz Farm Animal Sanctuary down in it's down in southeast southeast England. She's a long term vegan. She used to, used to be um an activist before she became like running the sanctuary. And uh you know, it's, it's it's a series. You can find it on um, you can find it on Facebook and and it's on my YouTube channel as well. It's called Forward to Animal Liberation. And uh, we we have it's it's not it's kind of we 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 do tend to kind of resume it. Um, I think Wendy's got some health problems at the moment. That's why we kind of 
you know, haven't done it for a while. Um, and uh, th there's one of those that's called um, uh, What's Wrong with Mac Vegan? And it was, uh, it was our most popular one. It had over six and a half thousand viewers, I think. And that goes into this. This is this, like a thorough discussion of, uh, of, of whether, whether vegans should go into. <laughs> so, what, so what did you say? Uh, yay or nay? Uh, basically, uh, the conclusion we came to was that it's better that McDonald's has a, as a plant based burger than they don't have a plant based burger. Right. And so if people are going into McDonald's anyway, you know, like the flesh eaters are going into McDonald's, that's great if they decide to eat the plant-based burger instead of the um, the animal flesh burger. But people that are vegan, you know, what what's what's most in accord with the vegan ethic is not to go to McDonald's, but to um, preferably, you know, go to your local vegan cafe instead. Or, or eat at um, a place that is is less unethical than McDonald's, because all the time, all the time, see, you know, veganism is about making the the most ethical choice or making the least unethical choice um, uh, in 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 our lives. Mm, um, I'd, I'd, agree, I'd agree with everything you just said. I mean, I'm I'm yeah. glad. That I'm glad that that stuff is in those shitty places, but I wouldn't go yeah, into them. Yeah, exactly. You see, uh, the, myself, but, that's kind of what, what about uh, a campaigning question, Ronnie? Yeah. Should, but what about the idea of vegans being stood outside McDonald's, um, saying to people going in, you know, try the Mac plant, and then still be there when they come out, and then they can have the ethical conversation, maybe if they do and they like it. I mean, would that would that kind of work? Well, it's something, something that can be done. I mean, we, we, we used to do a similar thing with um, <clears throat> Tesco's supermarket where we had stalls. This is with, with, with Tesco's approval and their support. Um, we, we'd do stalls in their foyer where we'd be promoting Tesco's plant-based products. You know, like the, the, and did know, people the... go in and then come back out and talk to you? Yeah, people did used yeah. to. But we would give people information about the ethical aspects of veganism. It wasn't just about... I mean, no, no, that, that, but that, but that's yeah. what I mean because it's a similar, it's a very, that, it's, yeah. a, it's a similar thing. And Tesco mm -hmm. liked it because, of course, they thought, well, we're going to sell more of our stuff because of these people promoting, like, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the kind of, uh, you know, the, yeah, the, but the plant based cheese. If, if, if people go for the plant based cheese, they're not going to be buying the dairy cheese that they normally bought. So it's the same. So that's true. <laughs> I mean, that's very, that, that, that's kind of very true. But I suppose they, <sighs> I, I don't know. Tesco got a thing where they like to support community groups, and I suppose they saw our group as like a community group, and um, they weren't losing anything by, you know, letting us have a store because they'd be selling, you know, hmm. they'd be selling their well, stuff. The, and, the thing is, going I, I, back to your community yeah. thing, Ronnie, because yeah. uh, you were talking talk about, you know, away from the city centres, there's loads of McDonald's and that away from city centres. Yeah, if, um, if, if, if people kind of wanted to do that, I mean, I mean th there's a massive range of things that, that people can do at a community level in terms of promoting veganism. I mean, one of the things that we've done is, you know, locally we've got um, a Green Alliance, which is like an alliance of various environmental groups, and our vegan group is a member of that. And, and of course, you know, you know they they invited us to join and wanted us to join because of the you know because of like a plant-based diet being you know a, a, one of the ways of combating the climate crisis and being generally better for the environment i mean that's that's kind of why we're in that it's nothing to do you know they haven't had us in there for animal liberation reasons but it means that you know we can have stores at their events and when we do those stores we can promote the animal liberation reasons you know so it's, it's 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 kind of opened a doorway and so that's you know that's that's a route that people can go go down you know in a local area we have stalls at health local health events because you can go in there on the health aspects of the you know of the vegan diet mm. and you know once you're in there and you know and we do stalls at animal rescue events as well and stuff like that it's not just in the street you know there's these other and, and this is something that a lot of vegan groups don't do it tends to be street-based activism and there's nothing wrong with that and, you know we you know we we do it as well but 
there are other thing, other places where like, you can like your, stuff. like your village hall and stuff like in that. Your village hall, or, or yeah. you know, stuff. But then like again, that you happened. see there are, there are no village halls in the city, and so that compounds the problem, doesn't it? Well, I, no, I mean, 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 mean that you know the outreach in cities is aimed at shoppers, isn't it? And yeah, but uh, well, that's what I'm, I'm saying. That's probably why they don't think about it is because they're used to doing the city centre stuff, and so obviously then it would be. Um, but, but you see, when you get down to community level, you can involve a lot more vegans. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you oh, involve yeah. people that, you know, that, that you know, like, for instance, you know, there, there are people that kind of may not, you know, because of because of how their lives are, may not be able to kind of go on a Saturday into a big city. You know, like one of the people that delivers lots of leaflets, you know, for us, she's, she's like a, um, a young mum who's got her own little hairdressing business and she works on a Saturday. So it's very difficult for her to kind of go anywhere like that, but she can still go around and deliver leaflets. She, she does door, she... door stopping between um, shop back and signs, does she? Well, well, kind of, yeah. So, so it kind of, when you do things at that community level, is it, 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 you're able to involve more people in it that wouldn't be able to do to do mm. outreach otherwise. Um, I just just want to mention this that that BC has said because um, I'm going to be careful not to give any. Uh, trade trade names away, but we we used to we used to get um, from from the person or the people who used to distribute all the vegan friendly cheeses around uh, Dublin uh, Ireland. In fact, we used to get samples from them, and then the company concerned was taken over, and so then they moved on to something else. And I was having a word with with them, and apparently they're now in danger of being taken over again. And so this is the interesting thing about the bank mm. companies doing good things in the sense that we are talking now about the kind of um, avariciousness of capitalism because <coughs> if they see a market, they'll move in and yeah, the big yeah. fish will eat all the small fish. Yes, and, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, an example is Blue Island Foods up, up, up in Scotland that were kind of, you know, pretty much a vegan owned and run company and like in recent years become more and more successful you know got their stuff in the supermarkets and everything um they were taken over i think it was it yeah was well that's that's, that's what happened to this group that yeah they yeah were, they were yeah. with a with a big thing that got yeah. taken over so then they went there and that's been taken over and now yeah. they're doing something else and they're now in danger of for the third time now yeah it, it's very it's very difficult because that's absolutely true they because you know what what's happening is 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 you've got kind of meat companies and you've got dairy companies seeing the way things are going seeing that you know plant-based stuff's becoming more popular say so they think right we need to move into that because that's the way the market's going you see so what they do it's much easier for them to buy up existing kind of vegan run companies than to start the whole thing off themselves so that's what mm. they do. And, and of course, the colour of the money, people see the millions of pounds waved in front of them. And of course, they, you know, a lot of them jump at it. Um, I mean, it's happened in other things. Remember, the body shop was body shop out by L'Oreal, wasn't it? And so and everyone boycotted. And it's erotic, wasn't it? Is it? Yeah, everyone boycotted the body shop then because, of course, L'Oreal, you know, did it, uh, experiments with animals. And then that's changed again and the body shop was changed ownership and well, what wasn't everyone... Hol Holland and Barrett bought out by a dairy company uh, there was some connection at one time between um Holland and Barrett and the chain of butchers I think because it's to yeah, do with Ju I think it might with... have been Dewhurst you might be yeah right I think it was yeah. it's to do with parent companies see all these companies have parent mm. companies and then those parent companies have other subsidiaries and I kind of looked into um but this is vegan capitalism though isn't it really? yeah to, it, well that, that's right because of course you know that they, they just see this as another way of making money. Yeah. You know, and of course, yeah. You know, and 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 you know, I was looking at um, looking into <clears throat> all the kind of uh, you know plant based milks and you know the plant based spreads. You know the margarines and that. And um, I think all of them that are sold in supermarkets. The companies that produce them, or those companies' parent companies, also produce animal products. You kind of can't get away from it. It's like real. 
<laughs> kind of and, 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 and you, you think you think you you think you found one. This is a vegan company, and they're more or less proclaiming themselves a vegan company. You look into it, and their parent company is like, yeah. You know. But I mean, you know, Colleen is is saying vegan capitalism is burgeoning, but yeah. it's got that got that danger, and and that and that the first time I encountered that is when soy milk became popular, and you know, we we use we use be aware of plamil and all that, and then the supermarket started to bring in um, soy milk. And then the big argument was, do you do you kind of kickstart what's going on in the supermarkets or do you stick with the vegan st uh, stuff? But now you've got a situation where even if you stick with the vegan stuff, it's going to get bought out anyway. And it's, yeah, it, 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 it's very difficult. And, and once again, it's a question of, of, of kind of doing your best. You know, like I said, with the McDonald's thing, that it's quite easy. It's kind of quite easy to choose to eat somewhere else rather than McDonald's. It's not so easy to to find a plant milk that's produced by a vegan company. Yeah, it's, it's, just so like, it's just like lab meat, though, isn't it? I mean, that is not meant for vegans. That's meant for non-vegans, yeah. and and that's how I yeah. think about my plant. It's meant for yeah. That's how I think about that. So 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 you know, people have been saying, trying to say, well, well, you go in the supermarket. How's that different to going in McDonald's? But kind of, it is different in terms of 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 the choices we're able to make. It's easy to choose not to go into McDonald's. It's not so easy to find plant milk that's not that doesn't no. originate somewhere from a this company. Is, this is bad news, isn't it? Being yeah. bought out by Unilever of all things. I mean, um, yeah. I mean, again, again, yeah. I mean, Unilever, Nestle. I mean, we, we. I mean, I'm not quite sure if I've ever bought anything from Nestle. I try. I, yeah, I try and avoid them. I mean, Unilever. Um, I mean, e Ecova, which is a like a kind of environmentally friendly so to speak you know cleaning products and that over here that they're they're a subsidiary of unilever mm. so it's not just it's not just the um you know the food well, it's, i think it's like what you said they're, they're all kind of parent companies now yeah they're yeah that's, all these, and that's all difficult folios, when you, right? when you kind so, of look into it yeah um that they're Nothing all you can do about it it's yeah. vegan capitalism it, 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 yeah you, you know and and you, you you kind of try and do your best and you know uh, in 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 a in a in a difficult situation, and that's kind of what you know. That's all, all all you can do. I mean, how we how we solve that problem, I think, um, is 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 really is is once again really through vegan education. Because if we had a different, if we have a different sort of administration, if we had an administration that was kind of run by vegans, we could maybe start doing something about this. And we could yeah, actually right, kind of right see, now vegan education yeah. creates vegan capitalism, doesn't it? Well, it, it, it depends how yeah, it kind of depends how far, far that education goes because you see, mm. um, like in terms of, uh, I, I don't think vegan education kind of ever stops. You know, like I think you know, I mean that's almost a, a complete new program there they're running because I mean, for example, some of the <laughs> some of the influencers will promote things like McDonald's, right? Whereas we wouldn't. And so no, no, we, we, yeah, no, kind of, kind of, we wouldn't. I'm, I'm, I mean, but you but see, we wouldn't on the grounds that that's not really vegan. But you see, the thing is that you know, capitalism isn't 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 consistent with the vegan ethic. And the reason it's not consistent with the vegan ethic isn't really anything to do with plant based. It's to do with the impact on on the environment of, that capitalism causes through through its encouragement of of like economic growth. And the impact of that, when we actually need degrowth, we need to kind of be consuming, you know, less and having much less of an impact on the natural world. Um, you know, capitalism encourages consumer, you know, it needs consumerism to, to, to survive. Um, you know, but it needs consumerism growth. Though, it's it? encouraging yeah. it, it consumerism, encouraging production, all these, th all these things impact on, on the natural world in various ways and so harm you know, animals that other animals that live in the natural world. Uh, and, and so that's not, it's not a political and economic system, particularly when, you know, we're talking about neoliberalism, which is kind of capitalism made into an ideology, you know, that everything should be just controlled by the market, um, which is what we've got virtually worldwide now. I mean, our government not, now not is to probably, mention in the movement. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, the government of the UK is probably the most extreme example of a neoliberal government that we've ever had. No, 
and and so that that is not that political and economic system is not consistent with veganism because the harm that it does that system does to life on earth and even if we had like a if we had a like, like a a plant based food system right yeah that would be a, 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 under capitalism now a plant based food system under capitalism would be far better than having an a, an animal based food system under capitalism but it wouldn't be animal liberation because you'd still have the huge harm done to the natural world that's you know you know that's caused by you know by a capitalist economic system yeah and the bottom so line so, is as soon as yeah. the wind blows the other way that they, they, yeah. they, they'll just drop veganism like a like a rock if they need to oh well, yeah they, because they're not they're, they're not doing it for ethical reasons they're, they're doing it you know for profit they're looking mm -hmm. like which way is the market going all like we need to kind of we need to get into this plant-based thing because that's where the you know that's where the money is and that's what they're doing i mean it's you know it's the same with the supermarkets that's why they're stocking the you know the the vegan products on the shelves you know and competing one with another you know for the vegan for the vegan pounds you know they and are. it's the same it, it kind of what happens is, is 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 that sort of um in a sense radical social movements get incorporated in into um into capitalism sort of thing i, I mean I, I remember going on um i went on a gay pride louis and i went on a gay pride march in birmingham there's a couple of gay friends of, of ours wanted to give out vegan leaflets on the march and they said well can you come along on the march and give out vegan leaflets with us we said yeah of course and it shocked me that, you know, the float started kind of rolling out. And there's one from Barclays Bank, Barclays Bank, you know, the kind of worst bank, one of the worst banks in the world for kind mm. of all sorts of harm does to both people and the environment and other animals. And Barclays Bank is there proudly saying, oh, we support gay pride. You know, so that was a radical movement. You know, the movement for like gay well, liberation. They, they, you know, they, have, they, have the, they have the police there now, don't they, um, marching? Uh, well, right. well, well, yes, yes, mm. and 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 and, but you, and 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 like you, so so it's kind of been incorporated, and and like you now you now you kind of look within the kind of, you know, within the Conservative Party, for instance, you know, you've got you've got you know politicians that are gay, you've got you know you know people. Well, of that's, color that's it, though, isn't it? It depends on whether you you interpret incorporate as meaning we're making progress or not in it that's that's well that's well um but you see it, it's kind of in, in in terms of the harm that capitalist economics does to the world it's kind of not progress they kind of because they say well you know we we don't care we don't care if someone's gay we don't care if they're a person of color as long as we can incorporate them into the system whereby we as can, as they can to consume profit. stuff as long as they consume and this you know and this is what's happened so it's kind of been like you know there's been this sort of um uh, well it's capitalism consumes the consumers isn't it really yeah yeah that's that's kind of, that's kind of what's happened and, and the same the same has happened in the same way as they you know in, in in terms of the gay movement they were after the pink pound weren't they in terms of the, the you know you know our movement they're after the vegan pound the, the green pound what, 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 green whatever, pound, whatever. What? and so yeah. the only way really of doing <laughs> the it, pound. it the only way of changing that is, is is like educating people to be vegan but then educating people about what veganism really means and and the scope of veganism hmm. in terms of like you know if you're vegan you've also you know, you really do need to be opposed to capitalism because well, neoliberalism is, is neoliberalism in the way of that. In particularly, you know, you have to, yeah, we have to do something about that because it's not consistent with the vegan. I mean, that doesn't mean that all systems that were like so called kind of socialist were consistent with the vegan ethic either. Oh, no. You know, no, no, no. But I think that, you know, that, the, you know, that the, the type of political system that, that would be um, consistent with that. Would be would be something like eco socialism or green anarchism. Their system, you know, you know, kind mm -hmm. of political, uh, you know. Now, uh, Mr. Lee, yeah. um, our one hour show has gone for ninety minutes so far. So yeah, we... <laughs> <laughs> it was does though, doesn't it? 
you know. No, no, we we we, we, we were going to be very we were, we were going to be very good and make sure that we, we can never we can never be very good. Yeah, you know yeah, that. Yeah. But hopefully, it's been interesting for people. That, you know, the listeners and you know people have been able to take something away from from this. But you know, to sum up, I'd say isn't that isn't that like all these other forms of you know campaigning for other animals are, are, are bad they're they're all good and they're all valuable and, and all far better than someone sitting on their ass and not doing anything you know of course and you know i've been pleased to be involved involved in all of them and to be a supporter of all of them but at the end of the day you know unless we get a large amount of vegan outreach we're not going to achieve animal liberation so that kind of really you know that's why it's my main focus now yeah, and also vegan outreach that understands what veganism is as well. Well, is... you, you, you know, there's ve there's vegan outreach to um, non-vegans, and then there's vegan outreach to vegans to mm. explain to vegan vegans what veganism really is, because people might think they understand what veganism is and genuinely be opposed to the oppression of an other animals. So genuinely be a vegan because they they say, well, I'm opposed to the oppression of other animals, and I'm going to you know change my life as best I can in accordance with that, you know. Well, and, unless, Ronnie, we, we just have to accept in this day and age that veganism is a contested notion now. It's, it, yeah, I mean, it is, it is a contested notion, and a lot of people think that it just means it's it's synonymous with plant-based. And so it needs to be explained why that isn't the case, and that never has been the case. Um, and, 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 you know, that that's a kind of, you know that's a struggle all of its own, isn't it? But even if people, yeah, but, I mean, if, if, if most people in the movement get to that way of thinking, then that's what veganism is, isn't it? No, no, it doesn't. <laughs> if, 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 if most people in the world think think like black is white, then that doesn't make it so, does it? It, it is. <clears throat> it is. Veganism is what it is. It is what it's. You know, was originally defined as by the founders of the vegan movement. That's what veganism. You can't just change it to whatever you want. You know. Well, people are having a really good go, Ronnie. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Well, 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 yeah. Because I think that that either people haven't taken the trouble to look into what it really is. Oh, no, it's, it's not that. We know it's not that. It's their politics doesn't align with what the original vegan vision was. I mean, uh, and and I think there's been an in yeah. Yeah, we've got a lot of neoliberals coming. We've got a lot of people from the right coming in. A lot of people who are pro capitalism coming in. Th th these are now clashing with the original core values of veganism, and it's it's a contested area now that we're in. Yeah, but that doesn't change the the true meaning of veganism. Well, I think I think the the people on the other side of that would say, well, it might not for you, but it does for us. You know? So you can kind of just change it to whatever you want, like. And you know, maybe maybe we'd be people vegan if they only well, like that 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 is the way that, that social movements tend to evolve that they start off quite radical then a lot of people come in and a lot of the people who come in don't have the values of the people who start but, 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 but you see I'd say, an ideological I'd say fundamentally if those you know I'd ask the, those people the question you know why is it you're vegan or why is it you consider yourself to be vegan and if those people say it's because I'm opposed to the the oppression of other animals. Then it needs to be explained to them how capitalism and neoliberalism oppresses other animals. And so to be consistent in in their views regarding the oppression of animal liberation, they need to be be opposed to those political systems also. And that's how I would Yeah, talk. yeah. But the point is it's kind of talking past one another by then, because when you put out a, a thing and I see I see it on your stuff vegan for the animals it means more than that to you but to a lot of people that's that's what it means yeah but no no but you see it that kind of it, it's because it means truly that for me because i see uh, you know I, I i i try to include all the ways in which animals are oppressed by humans and, and and a major way that animals are oppressed by humans is 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 through our impact on the natural world, which is you know largely driven by capitalism and neoliberalism. And so, being opposed to those, you know, you know, to, to that system, is part of being a vegan. Is is part of being opposed to the oppression of other animals. So it is consistent with 
be, say, be, be vegan for the animals. No, because vegan totally for the animals is like saying it twice, isn't it? Because it's the kind of only way you can be vegan. You know, really vegan for animal liberation. Yeah, that's that's the core of it. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah. so uh, <laughs> now, <laughs> so Ronnie, um, let's thank everybody for um, sticking with us, and thank you very much. And uh, we will be back uh, next week, so long as we are Ronnie still alive. Yeah. <laughs>